here and post this real fast and we're good to go. Well, it says we're live, but we're not live. There it goes. Okay. I was like, come on. Silly technology. <sighs> Okay. We are live. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. We are, uh, before we go through the prayer list, just want to remind everybody, anybody watching online as well, that we refresh the prayer list next this month, which means that if we don't get an update, that name comes off for sure this month. So uh, please let us know if you want to keep a name on the prayer list. Uh, because, and also we will be doing the same with the cancer list because it's getting longer too. So, you know, please let us know this month because as of next month, if we don't get an update this month, they will be removed so that we can keep the prayer list within a reasonable length. All right, well, let's start with others with needs. Uh, I had received an email from Velda. It's a few days old now, but see if I can look it up here. She had given specifics about her family members and how they were doing. Okay. Of course, Bill is still recovering from his last spill. Uh, she has a niece named Hunter, and Hunter is on the prayer list. She's a recovering drug addict, uh, She's, but she did relapse currently in the hospital, may not be doing well. She has a two-year-old daughter and uh, her husband, Wyatt, is also using drugs again. So bad, bad news there. Cody Hoke, grandson, started using drugs again. Uh, good news on Debbie Hoke, who's on the cancer list. She is in remission from stage four colon cancer. So that's, that's a little bit of good news there. Uh, Tucker Wiltsey, who's on the regular prayer list, that's her grandson. He's doing well. His surgery has been postponed now because of virus stuff. Uh, so that's where we're at. With Bill and Bill. Okay. Of course, the Bunsies, we saw them last this past Sunday, so that was nice. Uh, Byron, yeah, I think he's back on his feet because I saw him at the corner talking to guys, so he's functional. I talked to, I've been, I, I talked to Kay all the time. Uh, Charlene and Tom are still staying at home for the time being. Uh, Charlotte's in pretty bad shape. That's, of course, uh, Jeanette's sister. She's been staying at a hotel in Kirksville and is running out of money. She's homeless, otherwise, you know, an, an alcoholic. Bad situation there. Not sure where that's going. So pray for Charlotte and pray for the family's sanity. Uh, let's see. Any news from Fred and Carmel? They're doing well. Okay. I think they've settled in for the duration, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. It's been good for them, they need stuff. Routine. Right. And care. And care. Yep. And the daily contact. Right. Yeah. Other people. Mm -hmm. It's healthy. Yeah. Helen's doing fine at Clarence. Just hanging out like everybody else in the nursing homes. You can do window visits. That's that's all you know anybody can do, including me. But it's something. Uh, Helen is not really possible to do a window visit with because she can't hear at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to be right next to her, and you can't do that through a window visit. So that one has not been realistic, but uh, communicate through the mail. Uh, let's see. Jim Franklin, I don't think he was at church this past Sunday. Uh, Jonathan and I didn't go back. John, he's been hiring Jonathan to work on his 
uh, lawn, and I held Jonathan two weeks ago, and that's why I'm covered in poison ivy. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm really itchy. Day, day 10 now, I've been dealing with this. I might want to wipe this off before you touch it. I don't know. I don't, it might be contagious. I don't know. It's been many years since I've had it, so I can't remember. Uh, Larry Stacy went and saw him last week in person, and really, mentally, he's doing pretty good. It's just physically he struggles, of course. So. Um, there's some amazing news on, on the Internet the other night that I read the story on. They accidentally discovered through researching mice in another thing. He's got Parkinson's, right? No. Well, actually, he's got essential tremors, which is kind of like Parkinson's. Well, anyway, they were talking about these types of diseases, how the neurons are destroyed, and that's what's causing it. Well, they they shut some kind of a neuron off in a mouse, something in a, in a mouse's brain, and it started growing new neurons. And they were stunned. This is amazing medical news. You might look it up. Uh, and so now they're doing a whole bunch of research into this area. And it was a simple thing. They they switched off something in the mouse's brain that made it start building all these neurons. And they, they're saying it could hold out great news for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and all this stuff. Because that's what's breaking down in the brain. So I always thought I'd mention it because of the nerves. And we'll take all the good news we can get. Yeah, but it was on the news last night. It's a big deal. Okay, great. Medical breakthrough, they call it. Okay. Uh, Marie, same. You know, uh, she fell a couple weeks ago. She continues to heal, but you know. Uh, Marilyn, one hundred and four. Yep. Yep. She has her up days or down days cognitively. One thing's for sure, she's ready to go see Jesus. Uh, Marilyn Freeman, you know, we've been seeing Wendell every week at church, it's been nice. Uh, Ann stayed home this past week. Marilyn is slowly getting better, just very, very, very slow. So that's where she's at. Uh, I don't know where the last are tonight. I wasn't here Sunday. I was sick. So. Oh, I think they told me they were going on a trip. They were driving to see family or something somewhere. I know he was sick seven months. Oh, maybe that's not. Colin was here somewhere. Uh, Colin was here somewhere. Wasn't she? Who was? Yes. Connie. 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 Okay. Connie. 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 The one night I bring back their containers, they're not here. <laughs> that's how it goes. Okay. Well, anybody else on the regular list, the authors of needs list, before we proceed? Moving on to the cancer list here. I already told you about Debbie Hoke. Uh, let's see. Janet Kelly's been in church every Sunday for a few Sundays now. It's been great to see them. Uh, Charles told me Sunday that she'd been in the hospital. Yeah, that's right. For a little while. For a little while. Yeah. But she's, she's had that same problem before. I told her to stop looking at it so much. She makes her heart go right. Uh, let's see. Josh, I do have an update on Brenda Bernhardt. She okay. works in our office here in Maine. And that's Lloyd Pelfrey's daughter. Mm -hmm. She's Brenda Bernhardt's. And uh, I think it's some sort of breast cancer, which I think her older sister has as well. But she's taking some therapy or chemotherapy, I think, and just doing her second round. Okay. So she's hanging in there. All right, we'll take it. Well, I don't have any other updates on the cancer list. Anybody, anybody? Well, of course, we need to keep our nation an active military in prayer constantly. It's a wacky, wacky world out there. Yeah. Great for the living rooms. All right, well, anybody else? Richard, you're going to get a lot of time down. All right. Well, Rick, would you pray for these lists? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just uh, are grateful for this opportunity that we can uh, gather here uh, in this building, Lord. Just, just pray over these friends and family with, with uh, physical needs. Some may have spiritual needs as well, Lord. Just lift them up. We ask that you would uh, watch over each situation. We know that uh, 
We know their needs. We just ask. Just Lord, just uh, especially now, ask that uh, that you would help this nation that you have blessed us with. We know that Lord, that your mighty hand can can heal this country, Lord. But it's going to take people looking to you for that very time. Lord, we just pray for, for our leaders, especially for our men, women in uniform, so freely give to protect the freedoms that we do have. Lord, just guide us and keep us. Most of all, forgive us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, one I did not mention, Mickey Ship had an operation this past Friday, but it went well, and he is home recovering, so that's why they're not here. So, all right, Richard, it's all yours. Does everybody have the, the handout from last week? That's what we're doing. It's uh, number eight in my lesson book on the meeting. Of I really thought I put mine up there. I don't know what I did with it. <laughs> you mean to go make copies? Yeah, you probably better. I, I think it's out in the car. Yours is out in the car? Sandy had some more copies, I think, in her book. Okay. I, we had to slam on the brakes. Some guy in riding a lawnmower shooting out of a driveway. I just got stopped in time. I would have whacked him. And I heard something go punk in the back seat. <laughs> I, I, we looked around. We couldn't see what it was, but it must have been her notebook. Went flying off the seat. Okay. Uh, but that's all right. While she's doing that, I want to share something with you. Uh, since last week, I, we, I've got... My copy of everything, so it's just we don't have enough copies to uh, hand out. I wanted to share some an interesting uh, study that I've had for years on the heart, because we're going to be talking about uh, in baptism what happens to us, and I don't really think this is taught very well. But this is this is a, a, an interesting study on the heart. What is the heart? That's the question. Um, and this study, this comes out of a study uh, about refuting evolution. You all know that that was a, a big thing with me for quite a few years. Still is. I just don't do as much of it, uh, refuting evolution. But uh, it's actually the national uh, belief in America now, in the world, really. Everybody believes in evolution. I mean, religion, they put it over in this little corner and try to talk about God. That's religion. But science is evolution, and it's exactly the opposite. God is real. He, he's science, but uh, evolution's not. But tonight I want to talk a little bit about the heart. <clears throat> Many people have trouble. This I'm just going to read this to you. And you can take notes off it if you think it's, it's really quite interesting. Did you find some? No. I'm going to make I'm oh. going to make that. Okay, thanks. Okay. What way to get back with? All right. Just go. Yeah. Um, Many people have trouble with the notion that man makes decisions in his heart. Uh, and in fact, uh, I've heard people use that as proof that authors of the scripture were ignoramuses because they talk about the heart so much. In fact, in the King James translation of the scriptures, the word heart's used 693 times, uh, including 90 in the New Testament alone. Now, I've, I've tried to read them all because I've read the whole Bible, but uh, Sandy did a, a study for me uh, this past week, and I got the, I got the scriptures I'm going to be sharing with you in just a, a little bit. But if somebody talks to you about making decisions in your heart, um, don't we know that all decisions are made in the mind? That's what the evolutionist wants you to believe. Okay. Um, Without, uh, oh my, nearly all modern expressions about the heart can be traced to the Bible itself when we're talking about the heart. For instance, a clean heart, a broken heart, a grieving heart, a heart that faileth, set not your heart on something, set your heart aright, Tempted in his heart, the integrity of our heart. My heart cries out with all of my heart. 
the upright in heart, somebody with a hard heart or a heart of stone, a perfect heart, a proud heart, a smitten heart, a glad heart, a wounded heart, with my whole heart, a merry heart, the tablet of your heart, to err in your heart, apply your heart to understanding. These are all biblical phrases referring to how important the heart is. So what is the heart? What are we talking about here? Well, the heart in Scripture is equal to the will or the core of man's existence, who he really is. Every one of us in this room has a heart, and I'm pretty intimate with my heart because they took it out in a seven-and-a-half-hour operation and put a new part in it so it would work better, but that was because it's a pump. And that's all the evolutionists want you to believe that your heart is. It's just simply a pump. It doesn't do anything but pump blood, okay? Um, but there's no reference in the scripture anywhere to the heart being a pump, okay? Um, but they obviously knew that it was a pump in the scripture because they said the life is in the blood. That's what the heart pumps, right? Um, and that's a scientifically accurate statement. That's what our heart does. And it's virtually impossible for an intelligent, civilized culture as advanced as the Near East, which is the Palestine area that we're talking about, where this book came out of, during biblical times, not to be unaware that the heart was a pump, but it's never mentioned as a pump in the scripture. Any rural culture like ours that slaughters animals for food would be aware of that. They'd know it's a pump. So the authors of scripture clearly knew the heart was a pump that was essential to life. And that's why the theological discussions they universally use the word heart metaphorically to represent the core of our being. It's who we are. It's our will. It's what we think about. <clears throat> a man may, for example, lecture or preach well on courage or morality, but his heart reward will reveal who he really is when confronted with danger or temptation. Um, let me give you one illustration they give here. I don't know if it's the best in the world because it's kind of outdated, but it's interesting and you'll, you'll get what I'm saying. Suppose a teenage daughter says to her friend, says that her friend Carol is having all the guys over to the night, for the night at her house. Well, you start talking to Carol, and a few questions reveals that all the guys really means both guys and girls. Naturally, leading to a few more questions from mom and dad, revealing that Carol's parents have not only not approved of this game, but they're out of town. Suppose this revelation leads to a parental decision that daughter will not be attending this game. The discussion that follows might flow like this. Oh, really? I thought, oh, all mom, all the guys get to go. Oh, really? How about Susan? Well, you know Susan. She's a real stick in the mud. Oh, really? I thought Susan was your best friend. Well, I suppose she's a friend. But you know, she can be a real stick in the mud. Mom says, actually, I didn't know that. I've always thought of Susan as a level-headed but fun-loving girl. Oh, mom, you know what I mean. All the really neat people are coming. Really? How about Sally and Jane? Come on, Mom. I never get to do what I want to do. Really, I'm not aware of very many restrictions on your life. But there are certain things that we don't consider very wise, and this is certainly among them. Oh, Mom, you're just old-fashioned. Now, you hear what's going on here? Okay. Notice the daughter's discussion did not flow from the scientific center of her logical mind. Mom, easily yes, Alex is over there. Mom easily refuted the rationality of her daughter's claims. Her daughter is thinking with her mind, uh, but the logical refutation did not all alter her daughter's decision. It was not her mind, but her heart was set on going to that party. That's the will we're talking about. We're talking about the heart, Josh. You just got 
We just got started on it. Uh, what we're actually studying is baptism and what happens to the heart when we're baptized. But we're doing a little study on what is the heart when we talk about it. Um, now, I'm, I'm aware that this is not proof of what I'm trying to say, but it's really a, a valid illustration, a teaching tool, because we think by analogies, and a parable is an analogy. This is actually a parable that I just told you. And who is the great parable teacher? Jesus. That's the way he taught us and helped us to understand things. Um, in the Bible, of course, 963 times the Bible, the heart is mentioned. And one of those that I read to you a few minutes ago was the fact that um, apply your heart to understand it. It's talking about your will. Every one of these references is, is to the will of a person. Um, so this argument was given in, in the idea that evolution says that the heart's just a pump. But the Bible's talking about the will of man when it's talking about the heart, okay? So as we get into this Bible study on the, on the Baptist and we see what happens to the heart, Sandy did a little study for me this week on circumcision. We talked about that last, where's my, where's my other sheet go? Turn my book over to it. Uh, we're on lesson number seven, right? Is that where everybody's got? Did you get one? Eight. Eight. I'm sorry. Yeah, eight. And in fact, the other way. Here we go. And we got down to number three, right? Right. Did we finish it or not? That's where we stopped. That's where we stopped. Okay. Uh, so right here we talk about what three things precede baptism? So let's look at Mark 16, 16. Somebody read that for us. You might read a couple of verses before and after so we can set the. Um, and he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creatures. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And these signs will come to those who believe. In my name that cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and if they bring in dead and poison, they shall not hurt them. And will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Okay, very good. Worst time to get a cough and they were talking. Thank you. Uh, so here's the Lord talking, and it's in Mark's Gospel. Um, and it's at the end of the gospel, and he's talking, you know, at the end of before he's he's going to go back to be with the Father. Uh, these are pretty important words. Um, and he says, uh, go into, all, well, it's six, verse 16, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. So what's the first thing that precedes baptism? Belief. Belief. You might put faith there, you might put trust there. Um, depending on your Bible, uh, faith might be uh, what's in, in your Bible. I'm not sure I don't have another translation. I'm reading New American Standard. What were you reading? Uh, New American Standard. New American Standard. Where am I? I couldn't think of your name. <clears throat> okay. But I think it really comes down to this core idea of trust. Okay. The same way we're talking about the heart. When the heart's involved, it's the will of man that's involved. So the first thing we have to do is we have to believe, we have to trust. Okay? So let's look then at Acts 2.38. Now this is <clears throat> after Jesus has been raised from the dead and uh, he's gone back to be with the Father. He's left to the, the apostles with instructions on what they're to do. And um, amazing things begin to happen. Peter stands up on the Temple Mount, begins to preach a sermon. And uh, that sermon covers most of the, well, 14th verse on to the end of the chapter, uh, Acts chapter 2. And uh, we're going to read Acts 2.38, but let me start with verse 36. 
Peter's been preaching to this huge crowd. In verse 36, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, talking about Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the what? Heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what should we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. So right here we have that heart word. And it's talking about the will of man, pierced to the point of your being that your will is involved. The first thing he says is you've got to trust. And then um, the heart gets involved because their reaction to that is what? They're pierced to the heart when they realize that this Jesus they had crucified. So what is what's happening in their their Mind here is they're realizing that they've done something terrible, haven't they? And it's caused their composure to change because they're realizing the Messiah is the one they've been looking for and they've crucified this one. And you know, crucifixion is pretty permanent, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you get crucified, it's over, except in this instance. Okay, so what's the next thing we got to do? Repent. Repent. Okay. Now, let's talk a minute about repentance. What does repentance literally mean? Does anybody know? 180-degree turn. Okay, 180-degree turn is pretty good. Now, it begins with sorrow in the heart. It begins with that will of ours saying, oh, man, I messed up here. But it doesn't stop there. You have to make that 180-degree turn like, what's your name, Josh? said, you got to go the other way. you got to you gotta turn your will and say, I'm going this way. I'm not going the way I've been going. One of the most difficult things to do is to change people's will when it comes to the gospel, especially in today's world because most people believe what? Evolution. That's the doctrine of the world. That's the scientific, quote, doctrine of the world. They say evolution, yet evolution has never been proven scientifically one iota. But much of the Bible has been proven scientifically. But it shows you how far we've come as uh, human beings. So, sorrow, regret, these are all ideas that are tied up in this idea of repentance. But as Josh said, we turn and we say, no, I'm going to do something else. Real repentance, there is a turn to do something else. And if you're dealing with people, sharing about Jesus this is what you want to see. I'm sure Josh has been through this, dealing with some of the people in the, in the jails, especially the people who are really desperate. Uh, they'll tell you anything you want to hear uh, because they want to get out of their circumstance. But they're not really changing their will at all. They're just saying what they think people need to do. In fact, that's one of the reasons I quit from this prison ministry. I did it for a number of years. Uh, the 10 years I was in Bible college, got really involved in that. Maximum security down at Jefferson City, and you talk about a terrifying place. But everybody was calling you all the time. <clears throat> uh, and it just got discouraging trying to figure out who was sincere and who wasn't. But anyway, repentance is what you should see when there's repentance is you should see a, a change of the person's will. They want to turn towards um, something other than the life they've been living. Okay, so let's then somebody read for us chapter 8 of the book of Acts, and we're going to see an illustration of this. I'm sorry, you as well? Romans 10, 9, and 10. But I think that the King James Version has that. Okay, well, let's look at Acts 8, 37, and we'll read the Romans. Keep that passage in mind, okay? And this, I have a very old copy of this Banker's workbook that's not even being published anymore. In fact, I was told by the publishers that I could reprint it all I wanted. 
but mine's an old copy and there were some updates, I think, maybe in some newer copies of it. And I had a newer copy at one time, but it's, I don't know where it's at, and I may have copied some of these from there. Okay, so Roman, uh, Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. Somebody want to, let's see. Let's begin with... Uh, Uh, well, let's set the stage here, and then somebody read from 34 off. Uh, Philip's been uh, brought out into the desert to meet a eunuch uh, who's been reading the scriptures. I believe it's in Isaiah. And that's where we pick up here uh, in verse 34. So somebody want to read that for us? And re read on down through 38, or 39, excuse me. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, <clears throat> and who does the prophet say this? For himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and reading from the scripture, this scripture, he preached Jesus to them. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and he would say, Look, water, for her must have been being baptized. And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went into the water. Philip was well as a eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. Yeah, quite an amazing story. But there's that word heart again. Okay? What does he say? He says, if you believe with all of your heart, it doesn't say anything about his mind. In other words, if your will, if you if you really want to change your life, and, he, and of course this guy had been cruising along, he'd been reading a passage of scripture from Isaiah, I believe it was, and um, Philip preaches Christ to him, and his will is changed. Look, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? So we know if he taught him about baptism, it's very much a part of the essential message of getting right with the Lord. And Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And that's really all a, a person needs to do, is believe with all their heart. They may, because we're going to see in a little bit that something happens when you go down in that water. God uses that water to do something. And it's his choice, not ours. <clears throat> okay. So, let's stop right there. Wait a minute. So what's the third thing we should have on our on our List what we should have for that there. Huh? Acts 8 30. Okay, verse 37. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What is that? Confession. That's his confession. Faith, repentance, confession. Okay, belief, confession. Excuse me. Repentance, confession. Confession simply means to confess that you believe that thing. And that's what he's done. We don't know, we don't know exactly what Philip said to him, except that beginning, uh, he opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, Isaiah, he preached Jesus to him. And he confessed it. I believe Jesus is what? The Messiah, the anointed one, the one who can deliver me from my sins. So we have three things that proceed baptism. And two of them are mentioned right off in the scripture that there's something going on in the heart, the will of this person. Faith, repentance, and confession. Okay, so let's look at item number four. Now, before we get into that, I want to share this little study on the... Let's see, is this what I want to do? No, we're going to do that. We're going to we're going to do it here when we get down to item three on number four. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and do number one first. What three things are promised after baptism? So wait a minute. Sandy had a verse in Romans ten ten. Romans ten nine and ten. Yes. Verse thirty seven is in all because it. Wasn't it in brackets? Messages? Yeah. Okay. Romans 10, 9. Read, can you read it to us? Yeah. It has the same thing. Just in the so that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, you God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Okay. 
And that's a good point you bring up because in my Bible, that's in brackets. If you're reading the NASB, it's in brackets, which means some Bibles don't include that. It's, and it's, huh? it's not in the NASB. Okay. And some of those, it's not just some of those Bibles don't have it, but it's usually the oldest translations don't have it. That's why they, they're, they don't include it. Okay. So that was, I want to write this down on my Romans 10. Nine and ten. Nine and ten. All right, very good. Thank you. So, Richard, isn't that the passage that many uh, Baptist faith use? Well, this is why we're going through this study. Study is most of the denominational world is faith only. Okay, meaning all you have to do is trust. Okay, but you can't prove that from the scriptures. It does say that faith is important. Uh, and it uses it in, in various places. But when you study a topic in the Bible of any kind, you should look at all of the verses, what they say. And, it, and, and the reason that I think this study is so important is the fact that so many people we meet, I've got lots of Baptist friends who are great people. I've got lots of Presbyterian friends, Assembly of God friends, people who are faith only. And I'm not going to judge them. They, they stand for the same judge I stand for. But if you're going to teach the scripture, and we're talking kids and grandkids and all the rest of it in your family, whatever, you need to make sure they understand what's happening. And we're, this is the reason I'm stressing the heart tonight and had a little talk about what is the heart. You guys maybe missed that. Did you get that or not? When you walked in, I don't remember where you were at. Okay. Well, we, we did a little study on establishing that the heart is referencing the will of man, not the mind of man. Okay, it's the heart is never mentioned with that in the Bible, but evolutionists, which is the predominant belief system out here in, in the world now, is evolution. It says no, you do everything with your mind. The heart's just a pump. Okay, but they're missing the whole fact that we have a will that God has given us. Is this making sense to everybody? I hope it's not. So it's interesting, Richard, that when you continue to read Romans ten ten. Go ahead. Which says, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are okay. saved. Yeah, that is very good. Because evolution says, no, you, you think with your mind. And when you get into an argument with, you try not to argue with these people, when you try to share the truth of it, they'll try to say, no, there's no such thing as that. That's religion. You see my point? They're saying that's religion if you're talking about having feeling bad in your heart, sorry, because they don't believe in any of that. The pure evolutionist who teaches this stuff, they teach that you're just a machine and you're here for a little while, you disappear, you have, you know, whatever you are has, has no uh, being beyond this existence. Poof, you're on. You came into existence, poof, you're gone. And this is why we have things like abortion on demand and all the other things that are going on in our society. That's the reason we have people changing their sex, because it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's getting way out of hand. But this is what the Bible said would happen in the last days. Morally, ethically, and everything else, we'd be slipping off the edge. Okay. I flipped my page and lost where I was. Okay, we're on question four. Romans 10.10, 10. everybody got that written down uh, after confession there also? That's a really good place. Verses 9 and 10 to follow. Now this whole thing talking about the heart, the reason I'm bringing this up is I've been with a Christian church for over 40 years now and I've never... I've heard it, the Colossians 2 passions that we looked at last week preached, but I've never had it tied into this with the heart thing, okay? And we're going to see that when we get down to item 3 here, okay? What three things then, first one, what three things, or we have, did we go to Acts 2.38? No, we went back to Sandy's Romans passage. Let's go back to Acts 2.38, and I'll read that verse. And then we need to ask ourselves, what three things are promised after baptism? This is after baptism. 
Okay. And Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what's the first thing that happens when you're baptized? Receive the Holy Spirit. Huh? Receive the Holy Spirit. Wash away your sin. Okay, that comes second. What's the first thing that happens? Forgiveness of your sins. Then you get the Holy Spirit. That's our second question there, answer. You get both of those things, but in order, forgiveness comes first, then God gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? But what's going on here? What's happening when you go down in that water? First of all, God has chosen a moment in your life when you can confidently say, I was obedient to the Word of God, and I did what He said to do. And He does two things. He forgives us, and he gives us the Holy Spirit. It's very important for people to understand that, that something's going to happen when you go down in that water. Now, it's not like you're going to come up out of the water like a flash of fire and all of a sudden you're a changed person. But if you go down with the right will, the right heart, you're going to come up out of that water feeling pretty doggone good. I know I did. And by the way, that was my second baptism. I assured you I was baptized as an infant and struggled for years because my foundation was not solid. God had not been able to do something for me by sprinkling me because it's only done when you're immersed in that water. Okay? So turn right now for item number three, salvation. How do I get saved? What has to happen is in Colossians chapter 2. So turn to that. Colossians chapter 2. And like I said, you don't normally hear this taught in our churches. And it's sad because if it was taught a little better, then less people would struggle with this, I think. Colossians 2 and verse, we're going to start. Well, let, let, me, let me read it beforehand. We're going to begin at verse 8, okay? Now here's what Paul says to the church. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy. We talked about that last week. An empty deception according to the traditions of men. I was sprinkled in the Presbyterian church according to the philosophy of the Presbyterians. Sprinkling is valid because they don't know what's going on in baptism. According to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the word, world rather than according to Christ. Verse 9, for in him, Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised. Remember we talked about that last week? Everybody knows what circumcision is. With a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. That's when this takes place. When you go down in that water, guess what God does? You know that born again idea that Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again? And he said, how am I supposed to do that? Go back into my mother's womb? And Jesus said, no, you don't understand. Because up until that moment, everybody in the Jewish race knew what circumcision was, and they knew what circumcision of the heart was. And I'll prove that to you in a minute, because i got all the verses on it. Circumcision of the heart had to take place, but it hadn't been taught yet. But Jesus gave Nicodemus a little view of it. He said, you must be born again. Does that make sense to you? Nicodemus would be, we'd all been just like, what are you talking about? Because he brings a new concept here, and Paul's teaching us what that new concept is. When you go down in that water, God spiritually cuts out what? What is he taking out of our heart? The will to defy God. So he's changing our will when we go down in that water. Most people don't realize what's going to happen to them if they're sincere when they go down in that water. And you've seen it. 
you, I hope most of you have seen the most corrupt guy or gal or a person who's just really been messed up, and they come to Christ, and boy, do they change. It's amazing. The real transformation, because their heart changed. Their will changed. They're what we call born again. And Jesus Christ does it when they go down in that water. So when I'm baptized, I try to tell the, the audience that what's going to happen when you go down in this water is this person, if they're sincere in their repentance and confession, is going to have their heart changed. God's going to take a spiritual knife and he's going to cut the pride out of the heart because that's the pride. It's the pride, the will of man that says, no, I'm going to do things my own way. I don't want God telling me what to do. And I've seen some hardcore people, their lives change. It's amazing. It happened to me. I was hardcore against the religion when I got saved. Because I grew up in that Presbyterian church, and they taught me a bunch of lies, and I finally realized it. And I left, and I thought, this ain't for me. But then I grew up, that was at 14 years old. I grew up, went to Vietnam, got, well, got married, went to Vietnam, had children, and all the rest, and realized, man, this life is tough. And got to wonder about God again and thought, well, maybe I ought to go back there and see if there was a lot of good things there, too, you know, that I was taught. But I was never taught this. Sprinkle as a, a six-year-old. What's that do for a six-year-old if he doesn't understand it? And then you think about it. But baptism is one of the foundations of the Christian wall. Faith, repentance, confession, and baptism any one of those missing, you got a problem. If the born again, not, how about confession? If we're not willing to confess that Jesus is Lord, do you think any of the rest of it matters? No, it's not going to work. How about repentance? I'm a drug dealer out here and I'm shooting and killing people and selling drugs and I come to Jesus and I'm not going to change my ways. Think it's going to do any good? No. If that's missing, how about believe? A lot of people believe, but they leave the other stuff out. So we were talking about faith only earlier with Rick. Belief is great. I know people. I got some people really close to me that believe, but their life doesn't evidence that they trust or that they, and, and they're faith only people, they've never been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Now they may have been baptized. I think I shared with you last week about my granddaughter Shelby being baptized and that Baptist youth minister said, now before we do this baptism, we had seven candidates there with these kids. We want you to understand that baptism has nothing to do with salvation. And Shelby and I had just been through all the scriptures. And she turned and looked at me standing there in that lake. Her eyes were that big like, Grandpa, what did I do? I almost jumped out of my skin, but I didn't make a scene because there was a huge crowd there. But we had a little talk about it afterwards. And I said, see what I mean, hon? Not everybody teaches the truth. You read it in the Bible and you obeyed what you read. Because she came to Jesus on her own with her mom in her bedroom one night. But they were attending a Baptist church, which is faith only. And they teach that baptism has nothing to do with your salvation. Well, when does God make you new again? He has a moment. He wants you to know there's a moment that he makes you new again. And this is what brings you back when you're in your struggle of your Christian life. We all have them. I still have them to this day. To say, now, wait a minute. I'm a believer. God's forgiven me for my sins. And I've got what? The Holy Spirit. Because God doesn't just cut that old heart away and leave you. As Virgil said, he gives us the Holy Spirit. He put that Holy Spirit in there. Now we've got some power. The Holy Spirit of God is inside us, working out of us. Versus outside trying to get our attention. You see the difference? So we got to teach our young people that you're going to have a heart change when you go down in that water. If you're sincere, it takes a sincere heart. There's no question about it. And I read you a bunch, a whole bunch of statements about the heart in the Bible. 630 times it's mentioned in the Bible. And every time it's mentioned, it has to do with the will of man. Okay. I'm sorry, I get preaching instead of teaching sometimes. But I want you to see how important that is. On number three, salvation, washing away our sins. Uh, put born again there on that line. 
We're born again at that moment because God uh, exercises spiritual uh, circumcision. Let me, think of the word. Now, let me read to you a little, uh, several passages from the Bible about circumcision of the heart. We read it in Colossians, right? Colossians chapter 2, verses 11, I believe it is. Okay? Now, you can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 17 and find out the first reference of circumcision, which is the Jews. Okay? God makes a covenant with them, and he says the sign is going to be uh, circumcision of the foreskin. We know about that. Okay? We talked about it last week. Uh, and then I mentioned to you that there's a, a story in Genesis, chapter 34, in fact, where the Jews used that as a trick to kill a whole city full of people because they took one of the daughters, her name was Dinah, and they raped her. And they, the, the young man wanted to take her for his wife, and they said, no, we can't do that. And they wanted to get even, so they said, okay, if all your men will be circumcised and be like us, then we'll let you have our daughter. So they did that. And they waited until the second day when these guys were all in pain and they couldn't do anything. They came and killed them. Yeah, that's Genesis 34. It's a true story. How circumcision was used as a trap to kill people. Okay? Verse 26, Genesis 34 says, And they killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the edge of the shore. They took dice from Shechem's house and they went forward. Jacob's sons then came upon and slayed and slain and looted the entire city because they defiled their sister. They used circumcision as a trap. But in Leviticus now, we see the first reference in the Old Testament about the circumcision of the heart. And it's in some of the commands that God was giving to the Israelites about don't disobey me. Beginning in verse 38, he says, but you will perish among the nations and your enemy's land will consume you. So those of you who may be left will rot away because of their iniquity in the land of your enemies and also because of the iniquities of their forefathers, they will rot away with them. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness which they committed against me, that's God talking, and also in their acting with hostility against me, I also was acting in hostility towards them to bring them into the land of their enemies. God says, you're being hostile to me. I turned right around. I was hostile to you. Or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled, that's verse 41, Leviticus 26, 41. Or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled, so that they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. So right here in the Old Testament, in Leviticus, God brings up through Moses this whole idea that they have an uncircumcised heart. They don't know anything about being born again yet. They've been living under what? The law, the Ten Commandments. You can't do that. So here we're introduced in the Old Testament and listen, anytime you can prove your point from the Old Testament, you're on solid ground. Because all God does is he takes everything in the Old Testament, makes it new in the New Testament. It's a type. Okay? So, first reference, Leviticus 26, 41, to the uncircumcised heart. Then we get down to Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. This is just the third book. And in Deuteronomy 10, 16, God's been doing the same thing in the previous verses. He's been chewing them out because they're not obeyed and they're not doing what they're supposed to do. In 10.16, he says, circumcise then your heart and stiffen your neck no more. Now, the whole idea of a stiff neck is the idea of what? A will that doesn't want to obey God. Isn't this neat? When, when you realize how far back in the Old Testament this circumcision and being born again is, being talked about. It's setting the stage as God has always done. Well, how does God teach? Through revelation. He slowly reveals things to us so we can understand it. He had the Ten Commandments first. Actually, he had one. What was the first commandment? Adam and Eve had one command. What was it? 
Don't touch that tree. <laughs> then he went to 10. They couldn't do it that way. But he, he's already introducing this idea of a circumcised heart. Isn't that beautiful? All right, so that's Deuteronomy 10, 16. Then we get over into Jeremiah, one of the prophets, Jeremiah 4. And, and remember, when you're looking at verses, I'll just read what's before and after. It helps you with context. But the verse is Jeremiah 4, 4. He says, now get this, this is really good. He's talking to the Israelites. They need to be coming back to God. Remember, Jeremiah was a weeping prophet. He was just sick of what they were doing, just like we are right now in America. Sick of what's going on. He says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskin of your heart. How about that one? Men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of your evil deeds. So right here in Jeremiah, Jeremiah uses the phrase, the foreskin of your heart. That's got to be cut out. It's the only way you do circumcision. How does it happen? In the New Testament, you go down in that water and God cuts it out of you. He gives you a new heart. So you come up and they're born again. Isn't that a beautiful illustration? And here we have all these verses, Old Testament, same prophet, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 26. He's talking about these other nations, Egypt and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab and all those inhabiting the desert who clip the hair on their temples. For all the nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart. Wow. He's chewing them out big time. He's saying, you're just as bad as all those other heathens because your heart's not been changed. You've been disobeying me. And of course, again, this word heart here is talking about the will. Then we go to Ezekiel, another prophet. Okay? Verse, or chapter 18, verse 31. This is another beautiful one. Cast away from you all your transgressions which you've committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Here he's bringing out the whole idea that we get a new heart and a new spirit. He's introducing this whole idea together. You see how it's slowly being revealed even stronger to us through the Old Testament? Before we ever get to the new. When Jesus says to Nicodemus, you need to be born again, old man. And Nicodemus says, oh, what do you want me to do? Go back to my mother's belly? I can't do that. I don't even understand but later they understand. Acts, thank God for Acts 2 for you. Okay, I got a few more scriptures for you. Let's jot down, we'll be done. Acts 7. Okay, we look at Acts 2 for you. Here's Acts 7. This is another big one. And this is Stephen. Remember who Stephen was? What happened to Stephen? He got stoned to death. And Paul was standing there holding the the guy's window, right? This is what Paul got said. This is Stephen talking, and after this, after he says what he says here, he dies. He gets stoned to death. You men who are stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit, you are doing just as your father did. And he goes on down a whole bunch of verses there and just chews them out. And they're so sick of it, they grab him, drag him out of town, and they stone him to death. But he says, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. Here's the New Testament now. Paul's art, or Peter's already preached on the Temple Mount in Acts chapter 2 and told them, these people what they need to do. And by the way, that morning or that afternoon when that happened, what was it? It says 3,000? 3,000 accepted the message that morning. So they already knew what had happened. And he uses that uncircumcised in heart. Going down to Romans now, chapter 2, verse 29. Same thing. And this is Paul teaching. Let me, let me set this out for you. Verse 28. You have to read all of it, but verse 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Neither is circumcision that which is outward 
in the flesh. Now he's talking about the Jewish circumcision of foreskin. Verse 29. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. That's talking about the heart. And circumcision is that which is of the heart. See that? By the Spirit. Who does the circumcision? The Holy Spirit. Right there it says it. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart. By the Spirit. How beautiful is that? <laughs> Not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. Okay. You get this up, everybody? We've got, we've got one more for you. Colossians, you already know it. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And that's for men and women, both. Okay, we're at the end of our time. And I have all these verses printed up. If anybody wants this, these uh, sheets, I'll get you a copy. And stick it with your notes on baptism and share it with people. And if you want this, this little ditty I did on the heart that we started out with from my uh, evolution work, I'll photocopy that and you can have a copy. Put that all with your baptism stuff. And when you're teaching your kiddos or your grandkids, for your Sunday school class, and especially adults, let them know what's happening when they go down that water before they ever get in there. And I'll guarantee you they'll be excited to get in because they know something's going to happen to them. God's going to do a spiritual work on them. All right. Shall we pray? Lord, I thank you for this evening and the opportunity we had to be together to come into your house and to lift up those who are struggling in all manners of problems, health, and circumstances. Lord, our whole world's just beginning to look pretty sad, especially here in America. But we know that you've not left us alone. You've sent your Holy Spirit to live with us, guide us, direct us, and we're grateful for that. Lord, we know that your scripture teaches that broad is the way to destruction, narrow is the path to eternal life, and few there are who find it. Lord, help us to win some more to that truth. As we learn more about your word and we learn more about the importance of baptism and what you do at that moment to our will and to our heart. And so we pray you'll give us wisdom to teach that and to help people get their lives right as, as time begins to wind down for all of them. Bless each one here tonight. Bless their families. May they find peace and hope in you and trust you all. Guide us as we go home and give us a good night's rest and bless our day tomorrow. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll try to get this stuff printed up for the next week.